Okay, thank you everyone. We're going to get started um, on the next section, just so we don't fall too behind on time. Um, and those people can just, who are coming back can just um, join in when they get back. So the next section of our workshop is going to be focusing on conflict. So I know this might be a bit of a, when you hear that word, I don't know, I, I'm a bit like, oh, and it, it feels like I have all these negative connotations around that. And um, I'm sure many other people have that as well. So, so first of all, let's just acknowledge that, you know, we're all activists or community organizers or, or generally just people who care and want to change the world for a better place. And, and that means that naturally we're going to disagree and conflict is really inevitable. So, so as Rob said earlier, it's simply part of being human. Um, and it's also a particular feature of living in a world which is more mobile. So, so humans, you know, used to live in largely homogenous groups, um, whereas today there's loads of worldviews and cultures present in, in our communities. So it's no surprise that um, many of us struggle to collaborate with each other and, and then th therefore have difficulties finding a healthy way through conflict. Um, so it's bound to happen. Um, and while we unlearn old habits and develop new skills and awareness, um, we need to work cooperatively and, and challenge oppression. So, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, conflict and what it can entail and different stages and then and then come on to why we should even deal with it. So if Paul, you could just share your slides now, that'd be great. So first of all, conflict can often be signaling um, a, a couple of things. So first of all, that some needs in the team maybe are unmet and therefore conflict arises. Um, the power and our trust to care for all the needs um, involved is not currently within the reach and a change is emerging as well, um, you know, whether that's uh, aims or, or principles or, or just people in the team. Um, and lastly, our relationships, agreements, understanding of what we are trying to do, ways of sharing power and social systems may need to evolve. So these are a couple of things that, um, that um, what conflict can signal. So conflict, um, conflicts are often painful and distressing and it can be frustrating and destru destructive and I'm sure we've all maybe been in some conflicts or might be in some in the future which, which are probably some of those things. Um, and our personal, social and historical experiences of them are usually negative and traumatic. So we really want to find a better way um, of, of, of combating conflict and disagreement because how we respond to that really shapes whether the conflict is going to tear us apart um, or evolve and strengthen us. So there are five kind of stages of conflict um, usually. So that's just the next slide, please, Paul. So first of all, discomfort is, is kind of what, what happens. So you feel like a little niggle that tells you, you know, there's a conflict that might be brewing in your, in your team. And then um, following that, maybe an incident. So a bit of like a minor clue that um, acts as like evidence of, of this growing conflict. And then after that misunderstanding, so the situation um, maybe escalates to a, to a degree that either one or both people involved have developed maybe false assumptions about um, the other person. And then the fourth one, tension. So I feel like at this point, the clues are much more obvious. And, and this could be like an argument, um, an, an emotional outburst, maybe an out of character behavior. And then lastly is, is crisis. So this is the kind of the breaking point for that relationship. Um, and by that stage, all communication will, will be around um, that conflict. So why deal with conflict? Um, we hope that we, from this workshop, we kind of want to look at conflict not being a problem, but more of an opportunity. So conflict can really help us grow. So in ourselves, in our relationships with others and in how we work together. Um, also in our groups and systems, and it helps us to get um, a clearer purpose um, that, we're, that we share in that group. And it's an opportunity to evolve and to build our collective power. So one useful technique um, to, to deal with conflicts is active listening. And this can be an incredibly powerful tool that enables you to, to really connect with members of your team. Um, and, and it's basically kind of a simple process of just listening to what people have to say, um, but that's both humbling and empowering. And it can enable us to learn from others, to better understand the different perspectives in our team. Um, and that's why we need to um, 
use this when conflicts arise to resolve it. So it might seem pretty obvious that we just listen to each other, but quite often in teams and in generally in general, we don't often really, really listen. Um, and we're too busy thinking about kind of what we're going to say and, and all of our own internal internal thing. So we're going to try active listening um, as a practice. So um, if you want to pull over, I did have a slide on this, but I can read if, um, if that's easier. So we're going to put you in teams of three and we're going to just practice um, doing some active listening. So in the threes, um, we have three different roles. So you can be the speaker, the listener or the observer. And if you're the speaker, then you're the one that's going to speak about a specific topic. Um, it can be anything that you want, maybe something from today's workshop or something in general. Um, and you're going to speak for around three minutes to the active listener. And you're going to pause regularly to allow the active listener um, to reflect back on, on what you're saying, kind of summarize and reflect on, on what that person said. And um, yeah, so the listener reflects back on what they heard, but they, they don't ask any questions or they don't leave any comments. They just are reflecting on what, what you have said during that time. Um, and the observer at this point, the third person, they're just going to kind of observe what's happening. And then we're going to switch around so that each person gets um, a role. So yeah, it'll be about three minutes each to, to chat and then um, the active listener can, can interject and, um, and reflect. So, so we thought we'd do a little demonstration, just a quick one in case anyone's confused because there's quite a lot of points there. Um, and then we'll put you into breakout rooms. So, so we've not practiced this by the way. <laughs> so Paul, maybe you want to speak for about a minute? We'll just do like a shorter one. So Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I actually got quite a lot from the five stages. And the first thing I noticed that is that I do notice the, st the five stages when they're happening, but I don't act on the discomfort straight away, typically. Mm. Yeah, so what, what I can hear is that um, you, you recognize conflicts happening quite early on, but, but you, you're not um, recognizing it or doing anything about it earlier and you're waiting till it maybe um, gets to the later stages. And the other thing that kind of came up was that actually I have addressed it before and it does take time. But when I've thought back about what happened, it was worth it. So it was worth putting the time in early on to contact a person and work it through. Mm. Yeah. And I can hear that you might not have wanted to, to tackle it then, but, but when you did, it actually felt quite positive and, and therefore hopefully that might be the case um, for future conflicts and you might, you might do that again because um, it felt worthwhile and beneficial. Thanks, Jess. I feel fully heard. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so that was a kind of quick thing. So hopefully the um, yeah the speaker can talk for a bit longer than that and and maybe get less interrupted. Maybe every couple of um, thirty seconds. But yeah, uh, we'll put you into breakout rooms now so you can have a practice. And um, yeah, we'll, so we'll have about ten minutes. So about three minutes each, and every three minutes maybe rotate um, speaker, listener, and observer role. All okay, right, so give me a second. No problem. Any quick questions before we go? Is everyone clear? Okay. And it's 10 minutes altogether, isn't it? Yeah, so about three minutes each and then we'll come back. Okay, good luck everybody. Okay, welcome back everybody. Uh, um, just pause a second to make sure everybody comes back. Sometimes it takes a couple of more moments. I think everybody's here. So we're not gonna do a, a feedback on that particular exercise, but hopefully you can just self-reflect on what you felt was going on for you there. I know when I first did uh, that exercise, um, I found it initially quite difficult to to listen and then re respond, but then I got a lot better at it naturally. I found that when people were doing it for the first time, they're actually a lot better at it than they thought. So with a little bit of attention, uh, you can do a lot. And I think it's very much a foundational practice for teams and also for a functioning democracy. So really improving the listening and of course then leaving having felt heard by other people, which is another the fundamental and you'll know that there's lots of empathy circles that happen um, in in our culture and so if you want to we'll give you some links to the, the ones that are coming up soon so if you want to highly recommend going along to an empathy circle and 
uh, having a really good old go rather than just three minutes you can really spend a good couple of hours doing that exercise and i'm sure you'll find it amazing if you haven't done one already okay so thanks jess for that uh, section on conflict i'm going to move on to the final section now on empathy uh, very closely linked to what we've just been talking about um, and building a culture of empathy is is one way that you can ensure you create a balance between task and maintenance as it gives people space to be heard and supported um, so we're going to kick this off uh, by watching a video um, by a university researcher and educator dr brené brown which i'm sure many of you will be familiar with and this particular short video we're going to watch another one in a moment as well uh, is on what empathy is and what it means to be empathetic um, with somebody else. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's a, it, very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, Empathy is a choice and it's a vulnerable choice because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. Okay, so just want to give you a bit of space to reflect on empathy. And if you've got your notepad, you might want to make a few notes. So I'm just going to give you a minute to think about a time when you showed someone empathy. What happened in that situation? And what was the outcome of that situation? Maybe Jess, you can copy that into the chat. Um, so just think for a minute on, on that.
Okay. And we're going to do the same thing again. Again, just a little bit of time to just to digest what you've just heard and think about what it means to you. Is to now think about a time when you did not show someone empathy. We did something other than that. What happened in that situation? What was the outcome then? And what could have been done differently? Whatever comes up for you is fine. Okay, so in a moment we're going to show a second video and then we're going to go into breakouts to discuss this whole topic. Um, just a little bit about um, Brené Brown. She does a lot of research into shame and empathy, what they are and how they impact our relationships with others. She believes that our connection is our ability to forge meaningful relationships with people and such meaningful relationships are the essence of experience. She discusses a continuum in relation to human connection. At one end of this continuum is empathy, and at the other end is shame. And the bar that moves between us is, between these is vulnerability. So empathy for her is about being with people in their vulnerability. Shame can prevent us being vulnerable with each other. It often means that people are scared to show a part of themselves that they feel ashamed of. Feeling such shame prevents connection as it stops us telling the stories that can help us connect. Part of this, Brown believes, comes from this fear of not fitting in and being judged. He talks about the need for having the courage to tell our stories, but also the need for those stories to be heard, listened to with compassion and empathy so that people can meet us in these moments of vulnerability. So I'm gonna now share a second video with her talking this time about blame. How many of you are blamers? How many of you, when something goes wrong, the first thing you wanna know is whose fault it is? Hi, my name is Brene, I am a blamer. <laughs> Let me just tell you this quick story. So this is a couple years ago when I first realized the magnitude to which I blame. I'm in my house, I'm on white slacks and a pink sweater set, and I'm drinking a cup of coffee in my kitchen. It's a full cup of coffee. I drop it on the tile floor, it goes into a million pieces, splashes up all over me, and the first, I mean, a millisecond after it hit the floor, right out of my mouth is this, damn you, Steve. <laughs> Who's my husband? Because let me tell you how fast this works for me. So Steve plays water polo with a group of friends. And the night before, he went to go play water polo. And I said, hey, make sure you come back at 10, because you know, I can never fall asleep into your home. And he got back like at 10.30. And so I went to bed a little bit later than I thought. Ergo, my second cup of coffee that I probably would not be having had he come home when we discussed. Therefore, and so the rest of that story is, I'm cleaning up um, the kitchen. Steve calls. Caller ID. I'm like, hey. <laughs> He's like, hey, what's going on, babe? <laughs> what's going on? Um, <laughs> so I'll tell you exactly what's going on. <laughs> I'm cleaning up the coffee that spilled all, dude, like dial tone. Because <laughs> he knows. How many of you go to that place when something bad happens, the first thing you want to know is whose fault is it? I'd rather it be my fault than no one's fault. Because why, why? Because it gives us some semblance of control. 
But here, if you enjoy blaming, this is where you should stick your fingers in your ear and do the na 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 thing because I'm getting ready to ruin it for you. Because here's what we know from the research. Blame is simply the discharging of discomfort and pain. It has an inverse relationship with accountability. Accountability, by definition, is a vulnerable process. It means me calling you and saying, hey, my feelings were really hurt about this and talking. It's not blaming. Blaming is simply a way that we discharge anger. People who blame a lot seldom have the tenacity and grit to actually hold people accountable because we expend all of our energy raging for 15 seconds and figuring out whose fault something is. And blaming is very corrosive in relationships and it's one of the reasons we miss our opportunities for empathy. Because when something happens and we're hearing a story, we're not really listening. We're in the place where I was making the connections as quickly as we can about whose fault something was. that before I lose it again and stop the sharing okay okay so plenty to reflect on there so we're just gonna just go into breakouts no specific question but uh, other than what reflections do you have from watching these videos uh, so you may talk about when you shared empathy and when you didn't and then inquire into you what your relationship with blame is okay so I give you uh, give you breakout groups of three. So one of you may be in a two, a couple of you may be in pairs, but that gives you just a little bit more time each. And there'll be eight minutes all together. So you've got a couple of minutes each at least. All right, and then we'll do some sharing on the other side. All right, okay, welcome back everybody. Uh, I've got a few moments to do a little bit of sharing. So um, if you'd like to share off the back of that discussion, uh, type stack and they'll bring you in. And if you don't have time to get your a say, then you can always type stuff in anyway into the chat so other people can see it. Be good to hear your uh, nuggets that other people might benefit from. Really useful. What I heard there when you were talking is that this is like a, a lifelong practice. You don't just suddenly say, all oh, right, I'm empathetic now and I'm gonna be like that. Um, it's, it's multifaceted. And I just um, want to draw attention to something else that comes up in these conversations quite often is this temptation we have to say, oh yeah, that reminds me of when I was in that situation myself, thinking that that's a replication of what they're going through, which it very rarely is. And, is, and I think Kathy, you were making that, that point in the chat. Um, so thank you everybody for, for those sharings. Hopefully um, we can continue that inquiry in, in our practices, wherever they are. All right, well, we're just about about there. Um, just a reminder to, I'll hand back to Jess, but to, if you want to grab anything from the chat, I've put a lot of the resources in there. We'll also be sending you some resources as well. So so back to you, Jess, to finish up. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, everybody. So this kind of brings us to the end of our second module. Um, and this workshop has been really, really wonderful. I was honestly like a bit tired at the start of it, and then now I'm just like full of energy and ideas and like, yeah, you guys have been really great. Um, we do have a platform called Lumio, which we can chat on, um, like a forum. And from now until next week, if anyone has anything to share, um, Paul can just pop that in the chat and you're welcome to just hop on there and um, you can share anything you might like. And then we just wanted to share a couple of things which are happening um, like tomorrow and at the weekend, which might lead on from this session if you're free and have the time. So um, there is an empathy circle happening tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. And that's 6 to 8.30. Um, <clears throat> and there's also another one on Saturday morning as well. So if you want to kind of go on from this and practice more and be involved in that, then um, there's some links in the chat. And then on Sunday, there's a brilliant um, workshop, oppression and movement building, uh, 7 to 10. And there's an Eventbrite link to sign up to that as well usually happens weekly I think but um but it's really really great so try and try and get to that either Sunday or at some point if you can um all right so that that brings us to the end of the session um and next week yeah we're, we're going to be focusing on engaging communities so really really 
great workshop because uh, I created it. No, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, but it's going to be really cool and, and it's something I'm really passionate about. So, um, so I hope to see some of you next week um, and I hope everyone has a great day. Any questions, feel free to stay behind or email us. They're always uh, open to try and do the next.